Uh, sure. Well, I come from Belarus. This is where I grew up. I spent the first 17 years of my life living there. I come also not from the capital, but from a very small city of miners. So my entire family is in mining, who spends a lot of time underground. Uh, and I was the one who managed to have escaped. Uh, so with regards to authoritarianism, of course, Belarus is known for having one leader in place since 1995. And this political situation there is not entirely enviable. And uh, if you listen to some of the pundits in America, they would often describe it as the last outpost of tyranny in Europe. I started working uh, on technology very indirectly. I started working for a nonprofit organization called Transitions Online, which was uh, one of those Western NGOs that was primarily interested in promoting freedom of expression, uh, professional journalism, uh, but also we can say democracy and human rights in the former Soviet Union. And my contribution to the work was to figure out how to build their new media strategy. Uh, and uh, of course, coming from Belarus, at the very beginning, I was very excited about the potential of these new tools because the way I looked at it is that everything else has been tried. You know, we've tried NGOs, we've tried political parties, we've tried, uh, you know, building nationalist movements. Everything in the case of Belarus has been tried and failed. And here comes this new technology. You can use text messages to mobilize people. You can use blogs to discuss things you cannot discuss in the traditional media. You can rely on the power of cell phones to capture police brutality. I mean, there was a lot of excitement uh, around 2005, 2006, uh, which partly, again, derives from the political climate in Eastern Europe at the time. You had the uh, revolution in Serbia, then you had a few years later revolution in Ukraine, you had revolution before that in Georgia. Uh, something was brewing in Eastern Europe, and we had a lot of hope. And I invested a lot of hope in technology. But then I think my other cynical Eastern European part took over. And I have to add that I also spent four years in Bulgaria. This is where I got educated. And uh, Bulgaria is known as the rest of the Balkans for its cynicism. Um, and my cynical Bulgarian side, I think, took over at some point in 2006, 2007. And I became very skeptical uh, of the very tools and platforms we were using, in part because I saw that they were actually making very little difference to the situation on the ground, to people who were on the ground using those tools. But I also noticed that the authoritarian governments themselves were actually actively deploying those tools to spy on their population, to engage in propaganda by paying and training bloggers to spread the kind of truth that the government wanted to spread, by engaging in new forms of censorship through cyber attacks. And I basically saw the other side of uh, this digitization. And I saw that if we leave things as they are and we engage in this very happy, cheerful celebration of the power of the internet, we would miss the real story. And the real story, unfortunately, was that uh, certain governments were getting empowered as well. So in my own case, uh, you know, those two uh, utopian project on the one hand coming from me hoping that this might change the world for the better and at the same time a dystopian cynical side trying to show how you know well-meaning schemes all end up in disaster uh, somehow came together and produced my first book uh, which I think is entirely uh, dependent on my professional experience as someone who worked for an NGO, but also as someone who saw many of those early intervention schemes on the ground as someone who lived in Belarus and then in the Balkans. Wow. Um, you, uh, you, know how many, you know how many times I've been asked that question on the radio television? <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. You mentioned a, a first book that I think Rob talked about, a second book sure. that he hasn't shared that with me. Uh -huh. uh, what is it about? Ah, what is it about? Uh, so my next book is uh, called uh, To Save Everything, Click Here, The Fall of Technological uh, Solutionism. And uh, this book is in some sense a continuation of the net delusion in that I'm shifting my attention away from authoritarian countries, from authoritarian governments, and I'm looking much closer to uh, liberal democracies. I'm trying to understand what makes liberal democracies work, uh, why they work as they do politically, why they work as they do socially. And my hunch when I was beginning to write that book was that 
there is a new player in town, and this player is Silicon Valley. It's uh, geeks, engineers, technologists, innovators, who, because our world became so mediated through technology, suddenly acquired power. They are the new elite, but they are an unacknowledged elite in some sense. And I also sensed when I began writing that book was that they're very different from typical commercial players. They're not like Coca-Cola or McDonald's that just wants to go and sell you another hamburger or another Coke. They actually want to change the world and they want to change the world for the better. And all being engineers, they have their own ideas about how to do that. And they have the means, they have the tools, and they are lucky in that we tend to view any initiative that involves technology and information as being beneficial. Because somehow there is this bias in society that uh, as long as you have more information, things are automatically better because you have more knowledge. It's a bias that goes all the way back to the Enlightenment. There is an earlier bias about technology that Technology is great for liberating us from nature, and we should invest more power and energy into harvesting it to, you know, liberate ourselves from the burdens of the world. So, in, in a sense, we are, tend to be far less critical of them as players because we already have existing biases about technology and information. So, what I discovered is that there is a sustained effort in Silicon Valley to make the world a better place. And this is more or less what I call solutionism. But to really understand its uh, nature, you have to see how they go about defining their problems. So part of my argument is that Silicon Valley is now empowered to solve problems that may not actually exist. They think that politics is bad because there is hypocrisy in politics. Or politics is bad because there is partisanship in politics. So if only we can make everything open and transparent, if only we can make people more honest and uh, replace political parties with uh, you know, direct democracy, which you can now do because we can now vote on anything through our mobile phones, right? And we can read about anything through our mobile phones. Democracy will automatically improve. That's one of the assumptions that geeks make. And one of the justifications for that assumption is not just how they think about democracy, it's also how they think about our unique historical situation. They think that because Wikipedia and open source software and Google and Facebook have succeeded, we are on the edge of a new society with entirely new rules, with entirely new practices, entirely new institutions. So many of the schemes which would look outright cookie to us, you know, 10 or 15 years ago or 20 years ago, suddenly look normal because we are prepared for the next rapture. We have seen that rupture in the world of education and the world of knowledge production, and we expect that that rupture will now happen elsewhere, be it politics, be it the world of fighting crime, be it the world of, you know, healthcare, where now we can actually have consumers monitor their health and self-diagnose instead of having them go to the doctor. I mean, this is wonderful for many people in Silicon Valley because you destroy intermediaries, right? Because the idea is that intermediaries are bad. The flatter the world, the more easy it is for people to live in it. That's the template of Silicon Valley, and I'm trying to challenge it because I think hierarchy is often good, uh, verticality is often good, uh, networks are often far less effective than hierarchies, and then efficiency, ambiguity, opacity, hypocrisy, all of those in small doses are positive values. They're not vices, they're virtues, and we need to learn how to recognize them as virtues, and we need to celebrate them.